Here's what's left of the historic area of Awamiya in the Saudi Arabian province of Katif. It's a place around 30,000 people call home, but the Saudi government calls a hideout for terrorists. Over the past few months, residents, who are predominantly Shia, have either been asked to leave or forcibly removed. They're accused of taking up arms to stop the area from being demolished. The people who run the kingdom say it's time for modern skyscrapers and up-to-date infrastructure. Of course we didn't get approval from everyone, but most Katif and Awamiya residents wanted to see their neighborhoods developed and attracting visitors from among the residents and beyond. But critics say for a plan that's been six years in the making, it's been poorly executed. In 2011, Awamiya was the scene of protests in Saudi Arabia during the Arab Spring. They were led by prominent Shia cleric Sheikh Nimr al-Nimr, who was executed in January 2016, convicted of inciting sectarian strife. His death, along with 46 others, led to protests around the world, including in Iran, where demonstrators set fire to the Saudi Arabian embassy, further deepening the Sunni-Shia divide between the two countries. Then in June, Iran's Revolutionary Guard blamed Riyadh after Daesh attacked a parliament building and shrine in Tehran, killing 18 people and inflaming relations even further. It's Iran that is interfering in the affairs of our countries. And it is Iran that is uh, lighting the fires of sectarianism. Some believe the fight for Awamiya is less about religion and more about the large amount of oil the Shia community is sitting on in the eastern province. But no matter what the driving force is behind Riyadh's decision, the city has been torn apart and its people displaced. Vanessa Keneally, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now to discuss this further is Ghalib Dalai. He is the research director of Al Shock Forum, a think tank focusing on international affairs. In Washington, we have Ali Al Ahmed. He is the director of the Institute for Gulf Affairs. And also from Washington, Andrew Bowen. He is an analyst focused on Gulf countries for the American Enterprise Institute. Thanks all so much for joining us. Ali, let me begin with you in Washington. Why is Saudi doing what it's doing in Awamiya? Is it a necessary security operation there or is something else at play? It is something else. It's part of the Saudi war on, on, on the people of the country. And now part of that war is targeting the Shia. Over the life of Saudi Arabia, the Saudi monarchy have uh, waged a war on the cultural uh, uh, heritage of uh, uh, the non-Saudis in, in, the, in the mindset, because the Saudis view the Shia are non-Saudis, and they're not part of their history. The, the history of the Shia and their cities is, is, uh, precedes that of Saudi Arabia. And the Saudis have waged a war on those cultural uh, 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 landmarks, uh, not only for the Shia, but also for the Turks, for example, where they destroyed uh, everything that the Turkish uh, rule in the Arabian Peninsula have built in terms of forts, uh, bridges, you name it. They want to raise uh, uh, the other culture, the other history, and that's part of that. And uh, for this particular case, they are trying to destroy uh, and punish the uh, the center of dissent and, and protests against them to make an example okay. for the rest of the of the population. Andrew, is that true? Is this a targeted assault on a Saudi minority group? Like I think, I think certainly there are deep deep grievances within the Shia community in Saudi Arabia in terms of their relation with with Riyadh and how the state engages with them. On the other hand, though. We can also say that there has been a deep level of involvement by Iran and other external actors who would like to sow instability in the eastern province. So on the one hand, you have oh, legitimate um, grievances. On the, on the other hand, you don't have more grievances. You also have a sense of wanting to stir insurrection and other things, which makes then this a much more complicated scenario. Okay, let me bring it back to the studio. Gallup is. 
Is a Saudi hand at play here? Well, the trouble with, uh, with the recent events as well, too, the Saudi Arabia, they have to make distinction between who he defines as citizen, who he defines as Arab Shias, and who he defines as the Iranian. The trouble that I see Saudi Arabia doesn't make distinction between the Iran as a nation state, Arab Shia at region wide, as a, uh, you know, the integral component of the region, and the Shia population of Saudi Arabia as its citizen. So that, the mindset is a tr uh, problematic. In fact, uh, it is possible that Iran is very much involved in some of the activities in the Qatif region of the Saudi Arabia. And perhaps it is doing, and perhaps also like Saudi Arabia will try to like disturb Iran on another occasions, like from uh, Yemen to Iran. I mean, uh, Iran has been accusing Saudi Arabia of funding some of the Kurdish militias in uh, Kurdish militias activities against the, uh, against the Iranian regime as well too. But the question is, who are, who, how should we define the people that are in Awamiya, the people that are in Masawara district, the people in the Qatif region, they are the Saudi citizen. But the discourse that is coming from out of it is as if like, you know, the people that are occupying these lands are the, the, the proxies of Iran rather than the citizen of Saudi Arabia. So if Saudi Arabia goes down this road, if it doesn't make distinction between its citizens and Iran, the Arab Shias and Iran, I think it will exactly strengthen what it wants to weaken, which is the Iran. If you uh, try to like, you know, if you portray your citizen as Iranian proxies, after a while the citizen will become one tool of the Iranian regime vis-a-vis -vis the Saudi Arabia. So in this regard, I think like Saudi Arabia has to start by making distinction between its citizens, Arab Shias and Iran as a nation state in the region. Okay, Ali, I'll let you respond because I could see you agree and disagree with several things you heard. Go ahead. <coughs> Look, to, just to suggest that people uh, in a region, uh, a minority or a majority, they have loyalty outside their border is xenophobic and ignorant. To say that all American Jews are uh, Israeli proxies, that's ridiculous. That's, you know, repugnant. Uh, uh, the Shia Arabs precede Iran's uh, to convert to Shiism. And, and uh, this is the first Shia community, in fact, before Iraq. And the history of the descent goes back you know, centuries, not only decades, in that region. And the, uh, the, what's, if Iran hand was in Awami, I trust you, I tell you, I know my country very well, we would see fighting in Riyadh. There was no support. Iranian media, you can notice in the, over the past 10 days, over the past two weeks, were silent on anything that's happened in Awamiya. I know because I appear on Iranian TV. I never received a call for, for, for a, a more than a month regarding this issue. So uh, to say that without evidence this really is xenophobic and uh, repugnant. Uh, and the fact is the, the Saudi treatment of Shia precedes Iranian revolution. Uh, you know, and their uh, 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 extremism and view is not limited to the Shia. It's, it's even the, the, the only, uh, because this is a Turkish TV, the only Muslim group that labeled Turkey as religion, Turkey as a state, as a heretic, is the Saudi uh, government uh, religious authority. And th that's what they do. If they don't like you, you are an Iranian agent, you are an Israeli agent, you are a Jew, you are whatever. Uh, so this is really the reality, is you have uh, a government that's deeply sectarian that does not allow the Shia of Qatif, for example, or any Shia to be a mayor. There is not a single Shia mayor, uh, even in Qatif, or a single Shia diplomat, or in the, in in the Saudi Washington embassy, for example, okay. never had a, one the, Shia, one. So uh, this is really a part of a policy uh, that is uh, since the start of the Saudi state okay. that view the Shia as the enemy. Then, Andrew, why are you relatively certain that Iran's hand is at play in Khatif in Saudi Arabia, trying to undermine the Saudi government? Look, on the, on the one hand, certainly you could say that there are deep um, legitimate grievances, which, which Ali has, has noted, and how the role of being a, a Shia in Saudi Arabia is not the same as being a Sunni. And that's been deep grievances. On the other hand, though, you look at why does one take to arms? Why does one lead to kind of a series of an internal insurrection? And, and you look at kind of any, a lot of evidence also points to the fact that Iran has taken advantage 
of these grievances, that Iran has capitalized on them. You look at in Bahrain with the arms shipments to even in the eastern province. It's so it's not just to say that this is some like xenophobic categorization. It's the fact is that these grievances have been capitalized by Iran, and uh, which is unfortunate. It's not to diminish the fact that Saudi Arabia needs to take more steps to include their to make a more inclusive governance in the eastern province. But to say that this is completely not with no foreign involvement, I think is slightly is slightly naive. Okay. But, but more there broadly, is no formal going, involvement. There's no but, there is no formal involvement. If they if the Iranians take advantage, it's their but you don't know no no one can stop them. You don't blame the people for Iranians' action because there is no uh, shipments. These people had Kalashnikovs, which are available in Saudi Arabia. There, there was no no other weapons that they, these young kids fought back after their children were killed, after uh, many uh, citizens were killed and shot in the, by the death squads and by the American-trained uh, forces. Be, people were shot point blank in the street, and people have to fight. Just like your your uh, forefathers in, in Boston fought back the English. We are facing the same thing. These are people who want freedom from an absolute monarchy, just like the uh, forefathers of this country. Andrew, if you want to respond quickly, but I go think ahead. That there's a difference between that, though. Go sure. Ahead. I, I think that the more, well, a more the constructive approach you. would be to build is to build a more sustainable, like, there's a question of do you take arms up against the state and want a revolution, or do you want to work within well, well, the state itself? And I, and I think that if the, the, if the narrative the, is the, that the, we are doing a revolution, that's not certainly going to build worked. much trust in Rio, with Rio. Look, 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 Andrew, and, and then what it do you has see not as worked for decades since the time of my grandfather, okay, since the time of my grandfather, who would try to work with the Saudi state? It didn't work. They, instead of uh, uh, giving these people what they what they need, they were crushed more and more. Uh, the Saudis don't understand that. So uh, you know that's no. Just like American forefathers, they tried to work with the English, and that what happened? It came to arms, and that's the the reality is going to happen in Saudi Arabia, not only in the Shia area, because the Saudi regime does not want to give power to the people, uh, then and Ali, they are the most absolute government. Do you support taking up arms? Well, you know, it's not about supporting. That's the reality. You know, you. This is how history g goes. In every place where the government takes everything from you, the only result when they when they shoot your children in front of you, and when they destroy your history in front of you, then uh, they, what's what's other option? Okay. Like I said, in every country, if you look at the French Revolution, this is the American Revolution, I other revolutions, that's exactly what happened. Okay, Ali, let, let me let, give Galip a, uh, a chance to to respond. Well, I think one of the trouble that we see, I mean, we have seen all these words of like, you know, what you can do or what you cannot do against a legitimate state. The trouble that in the Middle East is state has been reduced uh, to regime, regime reduced to certain elites or parties, and this reduced to certain uh, groups or personality. And when you are against certain groups or policies, all of a sudden you turn on to an enemy of the state. This is exactly what we see in Saudi Arabia criticizing or being against certain policies of Saudi Arabia immediately reduce you to just uh, a component of an identity rather than a citizen, and that turns you into an enemy number one in Saudi Arabia. Well, whether you support or uh, an armed uh, response to a government or not, the question is that, well, it's not something uh, you can easily approve it, uh, just, you know, in an armed manner to respond to what has happening. But saying this on the other hand but the result is very expectable the result is something like it's not surprising this is the defining feature of the middle east when there is no public sphere when there is no political sphere for the grievances to be channeled improper through the proper mechanism this is what you had does the shia community in saudi arabia do they have proper channels to convey their grievances to the saudi regime and get a result on it no they don't have the grievances and when you don't have it is obvious what will be the alternative. The alternative is the, you know, the, whether it's going to be the armed response or whether it's going to be an underground organization. It is something that, you know, it's not something that is palatable, but it is something that we have had all across the region, and that's very much dependent on whether the, re the region, the regional right. states will have proper mechanism for channeling the grievances. And another issue at play here is, is proving their grievances. I mean, one of the complaints that Ali had was that he feels that the Shia cultural history is actually physically being 
erased. And many Shias have said that in Saudi. Well, that the they're... U.S. has said this as well, too. Right. But when you look at Saudi, I mean, Saudi has been accused of erasing cultural heritage exactly. in Mecca itself exactly. because exactly. in the name of yes. development, they've put exactly. hotels up, over yeah. hundreds-year-old sites uh, in Mecca. So, in Ali... Yemen. Huh? In Yemen. In Yemen as well. I think okay. Uh, go ahead, Andrew. You would, you'd been waiting to get in as well. One, 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 point, one point, though, is I, I think that if we, if we only just encourage a cycle of violence in the eastern province, we will never have a sustainable society where, where Shias feel part of their state. I think that what would be more productive is to actually take advantage of this moment where Prince Mohammed bin Salman is, is starting a new dialogue with society. And, I, and as much as I know that some have doubts about it, I think that there's a space now for dialogue because the only the cycle of violence just creates is not really any, any peace or security or no real actual future. And I, and I think that this idea that, that taking up arms is the only option is, is seems non-productive. And, and which dialogue and are it, you referring to? It also to? just does not which dialogue are you referring to? Dialogue in general. I think this idea that the only option one has is to take arms and kill innocent policemen is, is not a way if you want to have a sustainable future and in, that, in that part of the country. I think that that, there is a that distinction. just I think we should be more there about is a the very divisive on the one hand, politics. Been shot by, on the one hand, there is a no, distinction. Look, the Saudi forces is on sectarian force who came to... Hold on, Ali, oh, let me sorry, let Ghalib just, just say, say his piece Saudi, and then I'll turn to you. Uh, Andrew, mm -hmm. I think there is a distinction. On the one hand, no one here is encouraging people to take arm and kill the policeman. This is something that we all agree on. But saying this, we should not also, you know, we should not also disregard the fact on the ground and disregard the experience on the ground from, uh, from Tunisia, from up until the Palestine, to Egypt, to Iraq, to Syria, to Lebanon. So the experience of the region is there. If when, when there is no process or the mechanism through which the society can channel their grievances to the power holder and get a result for it, after a while, unfortunately, the arm has become a, a mechanism of response in everywhere in the, in the world. I mean, this has been the case in Latin America, this has been the case in Balkans, this has been the case in the Middle East. So this is not, there is not surprising. But saying so, that doesn't mean that we, uh, you know, we, can, we condone it. Saying that right now, Mohammed bin Salman is starting a societal uh, reconciliation process is quite, uh, I mean, it's quite odd to me, to be honest, because it is the same person that is the mastermind of the war in Yemen, and for him, war in Yemen has a very strong sectarian identity dimension in which the, the UN described the Yemen as one of the greatest catastrophes that we are experiencing in the recent decades. Mm -hmm. And you cannot deny the sectarian dimension, the sectarian motivation that Mohammed bin Salman has when he's unleashed the war in Yemen. And you cannot also detach what is happening in the Qatif region completely his regional policy in which sectarianism is a very strong component of his policy. Andrew, I'll let you just explain briefly then why you have faith in Crown, uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to rectify the Shia-Sunni divide in Saudi. I think we have two issues. Like one, one this very briefly uh, on, on Gallup's point that I, I think on the one hand you could say that there, are, there were many mistakes made in Yemen. But I, I think I would not necessarily make the same linkage between Yemen and the, and the eastern province. I think, but more my more optimistic note is, yes, I, I do agree that the current dynamic is unsustainable and that Mohammed bin Salman has an opportunity to really engage. And, and I think that it's to say it's too early to tell. But I, I do think that the focus in Saudi is socioeconomic reform. It's building a more inclusive society. I think there's a broader, we have seen so far a broader vision. Will this vision lead to something? I'm, I'm more optimistic on that. I think that okay. if you are an average Saudi, you're not, you're not wanting to be at war with your, with your neighbor or net, okay. let alone your own brother. And Ali, given and that you have very little I'm faith... that's I'm still taking more optimistic now. Ali, given that you have very little faith in Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, where do you see this conflict going? 
Uh, I think the, this conflict is going to spread, not only in the Shia area. Uh, the Saudis not, didn't only target the Shia. They targeted every local culture in the region, in the south, in the west, in the north. Uh, they only want Saudi history. They don't want Islam history or Turkish or Shia or uh, Southerner, and that's why they destroyed all these landmarks. I will have to let you have the last word, because very unfortunately we're out of time. I'd like to thank all three of you so much for joining us on The Newsmakers.